Well, hi there, and welcome to Storytime for Kids. I'm Mrs. McCurley, and today we're going to hear the story of Aladdin and his magical lamp from the famous book called Arabian Nights. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell so you get notice of all of our future stories. You ready to get started? Aladdin and his magical lamp. There once lived a poor tailor who had a son called Aladdin, a careless idle boy who would do nothing but play all day long in the streets with little idle boys like himself. This so grieved his father that he died. Yet, in spite of his mother's tears and prayers, hmm, Aladdin did not mend his ways. One day, when he was playing in the streets, as usual, a stranger asked him his age, and if he were not the son of Mustafa the tailor. I am, sir, replied Aladdin, but he died a long while ago. On this, the stranger, who was a famous African magician, fell on his neck and kissed him, saying, I am your uncle and knew you from your likeness to my brother. Go to your mother and tell her I am coming. Aladdin ran home and told his mother of his newly found uncle. Indeed, child, she said, your father had a brother, but I always thought he was dead. However, she prepared supper and bade Aladdin to seek his uncle who came laden with fruit and wine. He presently fell down and kissed the place where Mustafa used to sit, bidding Aladdin's mother not to be surprised at not having met him before, as he had been 40 years out of the country. He then turned to Aladdin and asked him his trade, at which the boy hung his head while his mother burst into tears. On learning that Aladdin was idle and would learn no trade, he offered to take a shop for him and stock it up with merchandise. Next day, he bought Aladdin a fine suit of clothes and took him all over the city, showing him the sights and brought him home at nightfall to his mother, who was overjoyed to see her son so fine. Next day, the magician led Aladdin into some beautiful gardens a long way outside the city gates. They sat down by a fountain, and the magician pulled out a cake from his girdle, which he divided between them to eat. They then journeyed onwards till they almost reached the mountains. Aladdin was so tired, he begged to go back. <laughs> but the magician beguiled him with pleasant stories and led him on in spite of himself. At last, they came to two mountains divided by a narrow valley. We will go no further, said the false uncle. I will show you something wonderful, only do you gather up sticks while I kindle a fire. When it was lit, the magician whoosh, threw a powder on it that he had about him, at the same time saying some magical words. The earth trembled a little and opened up in front of them, disclosing a square flat stone with a brass ring in the middle to raise it by. Aladdin tried to run away, but the magician caught him and gave him a blow. Bam! It knocked him down. What have I done, uncle? He said piteously. Whereupon the magician said more kindly, Fear nothing, but obey me. Beneath this stone lies a treasure, which is to be yours. And no one else may touch it, so you must do exactly as I tell you. At the word treasure, <laughs> Aladdin forgot his fears and grasped the ring as he was told, saying the names of his father, Mustafa, and his grandfather, Sim Mustafa. The stone came up quite easily, <gasps> and some steps appeared. Go down, said the magician. At the foot of those steps, you will find an open door leading into three large halls. Tuck up your gown and go through them without touching anything, or you will die instantly. These halls lead into a garden of fine fruit trees. Walk on till you come to a niche in a terrace where stands a lighted lamp. 
pour out the oil it contains and bring it to me. He drew a ring from his finger and gave it to Aladdin, bidding him prosper. Aladdin found everything as the magician had said. He gathered some fruit off the trees and having got the lamp, arrived at the mouth of the cave. The magician cried out in a great hurry, make haste and give me the lamp. This Aladdin refused to do until he was out of the cave. The magician flew into a terrible passion and throwing some more powder on the fire, he said something out of kazoo and the stone rolled back into its place. And the magician left Persia forever, which plainly showed that he was no uncle of Aladdin's, but a cunning magician who had read in his magic books of a wonderful lamp, which would make him the most powerful man in the world. Though he alone knew where to find it, he could only receive it from the hand of another. Hmm. He had picked out the foolish Aladdin for this purpose, intending to get the lamp and whoosh, kill him afterwards. <gasps> for two days, Aladdin remained in the dark, crying and lamenting. At last, he clasped his hands in a prayer and in so doing, rubbed the ring. <gasps> which the magician had forgotten to take from him. And immediately, an enormous and frightful genie rose out of the earth, saying, What wilt thou with me? I am the slave of the ring, and will obey thee in these things. Aladdin fearlessly replied, Deliver me from this place. Whereupon the earth opened and he found himself outside. As soon as his eyes could bear the light, oh, he went home, but fainted oh, on the threshold. When he came to himself, he told his mother what had passed and showed her the lamp and the fruits he'd gathered in the garden, which were in reality precious gemstones. And then he asked for some food. <laughs> Alas, child, she said, I have nothing in the house, but I've spun a little cotton and will go and sell it. Aladdin bade her to keep her cotton, for he would sell the lamp instead. As it was very dirty, she began to rub it. That might fetch a higher price. Instantly, a hideous genie appeared and asked what would she have. <gasps> she fainted away. <laughs> but Aladdin, snatching the lamp, said boldly, Fetch me something to eat. The genie returned with a silver bowl, twelve silver plates containing rich meats, two silver cups, and two bottles of wine. <gasps> Aladdin's mother, when she came to herself, said, Whence comes this splendid feast? <laughs> Ask not, but eat, replied Aladdin. So, they sat at breakfast till it was dinner time, and Aladdin told his mother about the lamp. She begged him to sell it and have nothing to do with devils. No, said Aladdin, since chance has made us aware of its virtues, we will use it and the ring likewise, which I shall always wear on my finger. When they had eaten all the genie had brought, Aladdin sold one of the silver plates and so on, and so on, until none were left. He then had recourse to the genie, who gave him another set of silver plates, and thus they lived for many years. One day, Aladdin heard an order from the Sultan proclaimed that everyone was to stay at home and close his shutters, while the princess, his daughter, went to and from the bath. Aladdin was seized by a desire to see her face, which was very difficult as she always went veiled. He hid himself behind the door of the bath and peeped through a chink. The princess lifted her veil as she went in and looked so beautiful that Aladdin fell in love with her <laughs> at first sight. He went home, so changed 
but his mother was frightened. He told her that he loved the princess so deeply that he could not live without her and meant to ask her in marriage of her father. His mother, on hearing this, <laughs> burst out laughing, but Aladdin at last prevailed upon her to go before the sultan and carry his request. She fetched a napkin and laid in it all the magic stones from the enchanted garden, which sparkled and shone like the most beautiful jewels. She took these with her to please the sultan and set out, trusting in the lamp. The grand vizier and the lords of council had just got in before her as she entered the hall and placed herself in front of the sultan. He, however, took no notice of her. She went every day for a week and stood in the same place. When the council broke up on the sixth day, the sultan said to his vizier, I see a certain woman in the audience chamber every day, carrying something in a napkin. Call her next time that I may find out what she wants. Next day, at a sign from the vizier, she went up to the foot of the throne and remained kneeling till the sultan said to her, Rise, good woman, and tell me what you want. She hesitated. So the sultan sent away all but the vizier and bade her, Speak freely, promising to forgive her beforehand for anything she might say. She then told him of her son's violent love for the princess. I prayed him to forget her, she said, but in vain. He threatened to do some desperate deed if I refused to go and ask your majesty for the hand of the princess. Now I pray you to forgive not me alone, but also Aladdin, my son. The sultan asked her kindly what she had in the napkin, whereupon she unfolded the jewels and presented them to him. He was thunderstruck, and turning to the vizier said, What sayest thou? Ought I not to bestow the princess on one who values her at such a high price? The vizier, who wanted her for his own son, begged the sultan to withhold her for three months, in the course of which he hoped his son could contrive to make him a richer present. The sultan granted this, but told Aladdin's mother that though he consented to that marriage, she must not appear before him again for three months. Aladdin waited patiently for nearly three months, but after two had elapsed, his mother, going into the city to buy oil, found everyone rejoicing and asked, what is going on? <laughs> Do you not know, was the answer, that the son of the Grand Vizier is to marry the Sultan's daughter tonight. Breathless, she ran and told Aladdin, who was overwhelmed at first, but presently <gasps> bethought him of the lamp. He rubbed it, and the genie appeared, saying, What is thy will? Aladdin replied, the sultan, as thou knowest, has broken his promise to me, and the vizier's son is to have the princess. My command is that tonight you bring hither the bride and the bridegroom. <clears throat> Master, I obey, said the genie. Aladdin then went to his chamber, where, sure enough, at midnight, the genie transported the bed containing the vizier's son and the princess. Take this new married man, he said, and put him outside in the cold, and return at daybreak. Whereupon, the genie took the vizier's son out of the bed, leaving Aladdin with the princess. Fear nothing, Aladdin said to her, you are my wife, promised to me by your unjust father. No harm shall come to you. The princess was too frightened to speak, and passed the most miserable night of her life while Aladdin lay down beside her and slept soundly. At the appointed hour, the genie fetched in the shivering bridegroom, laid him in his place, and transported the bed back to the palace. Presently, the sultan came to wish his daughter good morning. The unhappy vizier's son jumped up and hid himself, while the princess would not say a word and was very sorrowful. The sultan sent her mother to go in, who said, 
How comes it, child, that you will not speak to your father? What has happened? The princess sighed deeply and at last told her mother how during the night the bed had been carried into some strange house and what had passed there. <laughs> her mother did not believe her in the least, but bade her rise and just consider it an idle dream. The following night, exactly the same thing happened. And the next morning, on the princess's refusal to speak, the sultan threatened to cut off her head. She then confessed to all, bidding him to ask the vizier's son if it was not so. The sultan told the vizier to ask his son, who owned the truth, adding that, <laughs> dearly as he loved the princess, he had rather die than go through another terrifying, fearful night and wish to be separated from her. His wish was granted, and there was an end of feasting and rejoicing. When the three months was over, Aladdin sent his mother to remind the sultan of his promise. She stood in the same place as before, and the sultan, <laughs> who had forgotten Aladdin, at once remembered him and sent for her. On seeing her poverty, the sultan felt less inclined than ever to keep his word and asked the vizier's advice, who counseled him to set so high a value on the princess that no man living could come up with it. The sultan then turned to Aladdin's mother, saying, Good woman, a sultan must remember his promises, and I will remember mine. But your son must first Send me forty basins of gold brimful of jewels, carried by forty servants, splendidly dressed. Tell him I await his answer. The mother of Aladdin bowed low and went home. Thinking all was lost, she gave Aladdin a message, adding, He may wait long enough for your answer. <laughs> Not so long, mother, as you think, her son replied. I would do a great deal more than that for the princess. He summoned the genie, and in a few moments, the 40 servants arrived and filled up the small house and garden. Aladdin made them set out to the palace, two by two, followed by his mother. They were so richly dressed with such splendid jewels in their girdles that everyone crowded to see them and the basins of gold that they carried on their heads. They entered the palace and, after kneeling before the sultan, stood in a half circle round the throne with their arms crossed. While Aladdin's mother presented them to the sultan. He hesitated no longer but said, Good woman, return and tell your son that I await for him with open arms. She lost no time in telling Aladdin, bidding him make haste. But Aladdin first called the genie. I want a scented bath, he said, a richly embroidered habit, a horse surpassing the sultan's, and 20 servants to attend me. Besides this, six servants, beautifully dressed, to wait on my mother. And lastly, 10,000 pieces of gold in 10 purses. No sooner said than Done. Aladdin mounted his horse and passed through the streets, the servants strewing gold as they went. Those who had played with him his childhood knew him not. He had grown so handsome. When the Sultan saw him, he came down from his throne, embraced him and led him to a hall where a feast was spread, intending to marry him to the princess that night. But Aladdin refused, saying, I must build a palace fit for her. And he took his leave. And that is the end of part one of the story of Aladdin and his magical lamp. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. And until our next story, happy story time. Bye.